Hello, I'm Renee Cardio, the Director of Financial Aid at Allen College. Today, I want to go over the basics of financial aid and break down some common misconceptions regarding financial aid. First, I'll start with a timeline of what to do and when regarding financial aid. In the fall of your senior year of high school, the FAFSA for the next academic year becomes available. I'll go into further detail of what the FAFSA is soon, but this application typically opens up on October 1 for the next school year. When you complete the FAFSA, you can list multiple schools on it, so if you're not sure where you want to attend yet, that's okay. Just list every school you are possibly considering attending. During the late fall or winter and into the spring of your senior year, be looking out for scholarship applications. Talk to your high school guidance counselors about opportunities, check with local businesses, your parents' employers, your own employer if you work a part-time job, your church or religious institution you may be a part of, any civic community groups you have involvement with, and future colleges you are interested in attending. Most colleges have centralized electronic applications to allow students to apply for all their institutional scholarships with one application, but the deadlines vary among schools and programs. Check early in the winter to make sure you don't miss any deadlines. In late spring or the summer after your senior year has ended, you will likely start receiving financial aid award letters from any schools you have submitted your FAFSA to and been accepted to attend. Review your award letters carefully and examine your expenses so you can determine if you need to accept loans or if you can decline them. As mentioned previously, I want to go into further detail of what the FAFSA actually does and means. The acronym FAFSA stands for Free Application for Federal Student Aid, so this application does not cost money to complete. It is a federal form used nationally among colleges. The FAFSA should be completed annually for each year you attend college. Although the FAFSA is not required, it is highly encouraged because many schools require the FAFSA to be submitted before considering you for scholarships, even if the scholarship is not based on your financial situation. The FAFSA will consider you to be a dependent student if you are under the age of 24, working on an undergraduate degree, do not have any children or dependents you support, are not married, and are not considered an orphan or ward of the court. As a dependent student, you have to include your parents' information on the FAFSA, even if they don't claim you as a dependent on their taxes. The FAFSA uses prior prior year tax information. So for example, the 2024-25 FAFSA is looking at 2022 tax year information. As the student, you will have your own login and start the FAFSA, supplying your financial information and also providing your parent's name and additional information such as an email address for your parent. Your parent will then get a request via email to add their financial information to your FAFSA. They will be required to have their own login to be able to access your FAFSA. Your parent can have the same login if they have multiple children but each child in the family needs to complete their own FAFSA and have their own individual login. You can create logins and submit FAFSAs through the federal website, studentaid.gov. Once a FAFSA is submitted and a school creates a financial aid award letter, there can be different types of aid listed. The three main categories of financial aid are grants, scholarships, and loans. Grants are what I like to call free money, meaning it is money awarded to you to be used for school and you don't have to pay it back once you've completed school. Grants can come from federal sources, from the state, or from the school directly. If you are eligible for a federal grant, that is determined by the results of the FAFSA and is based off of the SAI or Student Aid Index number that is generated when you complete your FAFSA. State grants are specific to each state. 
for Iowa, you are required to be a resident of Iowa for at least five years prior to completing the FAFSA. There are a handful of different state grants based on different degrees and majors, as well as the different types of schools you can attend. Some state grants are specifically for private colleges in Iowa. Some state grants are specifically for associate programs and more heavily used at community colleges. Scholarships are also what I consider free money, but you won't have to repay. For scholarships, you typically have to complete an application, possibly write an essay or provide a letter of reference, and scholarships come from a variety of resources as well. Most of the time, scholarships will be based on your academic achievements, but can also be specific to personal situations or attributes, since each individual donor is able to specify their own selection criteria. Check the schools you're interested in attending for college-wide scholarship applications. Also, look within your local community, state, and nationally, as scholarships can come from all over and have varying deadlines. Loans are not free money and unfortunately have to be paid back once you graduate, if you leave school, or if you go below half-time enrollment. Loans can be federal, directly from the government, and awarded based on the results of your FAFSA and grade level, or they can be private from banks or credit unions. In some cases, schools will have their own institutional loan programs. Since there are so many options for loans, I want to break them down into categories and discuss the different kinds. For federal loans, these are awarded upon the completion of a FAFSA. You cannot receive a federal subsidized or unsubsidized loan if you don't submit a FAFSA. These loans do not require you to have a cosigner or to be credit worthy. They have fixed interest rates that are set each July by the Department of Education and annual limits based on your grade level and whether you are considered dependent or independent student per the FAFSA. Parents can also borrow a federal loan known as a Parent PLUS loan if a FAFSA is completed. With a Parent PLUS loan, the parent is the borrower and they do have to pass a credit check before being approved for the Parent PLUS loan. The Parent PLUS loan also has a fixed interest rate set every July and will be the same for all parent borrowers who have passed the credit check regardless of how good or poor their credit results are. Parents can also borrow a private loan on behalf of their student through a bank or a credit union. With private loans, the parent is still the borrower, but the interest rate will be based on a parent's specific credit information. Private loans are also an option for a student to borrow directly in their own name from a bank or a credit union. You would apply for a private loan separately from completing the FAFSA. As a college student, you would most likely require a cosigner to receive a private loan as they are credit-based. Your interest rate will be based on the creditworthiness of you and your cosigner. Most private loan lenders provide cosigner release options where the cosigner is able to be taken off the loan after the student has made so many on-time payments. Financial aid award letters will look different from every school and can have a lot of information on them. Sometimes it can be overwhelming to decode all the numbers and figure out what your true expenses are. All schools have to create a cost of attendance or a budget for each program. The cost of attendance will include direct and indirect expenses. Direct costs are the costs the school will be billing directly to you, such as tuition, fees, and if they provide on-campus housing and you contract to live on campus, your housing and meal plan may be a direct cost. Indirect costs are also factored into the cost of attendance but these are strictly estimates of what the school anticipates you may spend during the year while attending school. The indirect expenses will vary for everyone as each individual will not have the exact same bills and everyone has different spending habits. The common categories that are budgeted for under indirect expenses are transportation, books and supplies, personal expenses, and possibly housing and food. Transportation is usually an estimate of gas for your car to drive to and from class or class-related experiences. Books and supplies may be a direct cost if your school charges you directly for your textbooks, but most of the time, you will purchase your textbooks and school supplies on your own. Personal expenses can include things such as your cell phone bill, personal hygiene items, entertainment such as going to a movie or dining out, and many other things. If your school does not provide on-campus housing or you choose to live off-campus and have rent, utilities, groceries, etc., 
that is all part of your estimated indirect cost too. Student award letters can look so different from one school to the next, and cost of attendance or budgets can vary extensively from a community college to a private school. It's important to know how to break down the award letter and truly determine what the school will cost you. Don't let the initial sticker price scare you from even applying to a more expensive private school. Sometimes they can end up costing less than a state, school, or community college. In the example shown here, the first school, School A, has a high cost of $50,000 for the year. However, of that $50,000, only $30,000 is the actual direct cost, meaning the amount that will be on the bill at the school. The other $20,000 is the indirect expenses like gas, food, cell phone, etc. School A is also able to award $20,000 in grants and scholarships to you. Remember, grants and scholarships don't have to be repaid, so after the grants and scholarships are applied to the direct cost, the remaining bill would be $10,000. This is the amount you would be responsible for paying, either by borrowing loans to cover it or paying it out of pocket. Now let's look at School B. This school has a much lower cost of $20,000. The direct cost is also lower at $15,000, but they are only awarding $3,000 in grants and scholarships. So the amount you would need to cover through loans or out of pocket would be $12,000, which is actually more than School A, even though at first glance, they cost more than double what School B does. There are endless resources and scholarship opportunities to seek out and no way I could possibly list them all. So I tried to provide three main ones that encompass a lot of areas. The first resource is ICANN, which is the Iowa College Access Network. This is a nonprofit organization not affiliated with any specific school, and they are across the whole state of Iowa. They are a great free resource to help you complete your FAFSA, seek out and apply for scholarships, compare award letters among different schools, and answer any higher education questions you may have. The second resource is the Iowa Department of Education. This website has resources for you regardless of where you are in your education, from preschool all the way through higher education and provides information on the different state grants and scholarships for specific schools and programs. The last resource is the Federal Student Aid site. This site is used for all things related to the FAFSA and Federal Student Aid. You'll use this website to complete your FAFSA, borrow federal loans if you determine you need to, and repay your federal loans once you've completed school. This website is also a great resource for student loan forgiveness programs and provides explanations of the different types of grants and loans provided by the FAFSA. Financial aid can feel like a maze, but through the resources listed here and the staff in the financial aid offices of the schools you're interested in, don't be afraid to reach out and ask questions.